All right, thank you uh, very much for giving me the opportunity to talk. Um, I assume everyone can see the slides, yes? Um, yes. So yeah, I'm gonna talk about WarpX today. Um, before we start, I wanna note, I'm gonna show some, show some scaling results from Perlmutter and also from Frontier, and these are pre-acceptance, so just noting that. Um, I expect that if I re-ran these in a month, they might look different. Um, I also want to show, so there's a lot of people who work on WarpX. This is kind of a snapshot of what the current team looks like. Um, it's a multidisciplinary team. So there's people with like physics, applied math, computer science backgrounds. It's also a multi-institutional team. Um, most of us work uh, here at Berkeley Lab, but there's also people at Livermore and Slack. There's a number of co collaborators from European um, facilities like CEA Saclay. Uh, Desi and CERN. And there's also a growing number of collaborators in um, in industry that are using WarpX and also contributing a lot of great things back. Uh, so we appreciate that. Um, I, I also want to mention, so WarpX is one of the NESAP codes. So we've very much benefited from, you know, having access to NERSC expertise and um, also early access to like Perlmutter. And in particular, I want to mention uh, Kevin Gott is our NESAP liaison, and uh, there's also a NESAP postdoc named Michael Rowan uh, that worked with us for a couple of years and did a lot of great work. Um, so just some, I guess, background and motivation. So the, the main application of WarpX is for modeling um, particle accelerators. And uh, you know, when I, and I think when most people think of particle accel accelerators, they think about something like, the LHC at CERN. Um, so this is like a giant building size piece of equipment. I think uh, it's like 27 kilometers in circumference or something like that. Um, and it accelerates particles to fantastic energies and it's used for like discovery science. And in that it's been very, uh, particle accelerators have been very successful in that and have enabled a lot of the Nobel prizes that have been awarded in both physics and chemistry over the years. Um, but there are other applications of accelerators as well. Um, medical applications, for example, there are 9,000 medical accelerators in operation worldwide. Uh, these are used for things like radiation treatment for cancer or in the production of um, medical isotopes. Um, there's also about 20,000 industrial accelerators that are used in various thing capacities, uh, semiconductor manufacturing, uh, sterilization of food. And there's also a number of like national security applications as well. Um, the annual value of all products that use accelerator technology is estimated to be uh, 500 billion. Um, so the point we're trying to make is the opportunity for, there's a bigger impact, there's opportunity to make a bigger impact with particle accelerators by reducing their size and cost. And modeling plays a role here because it allows us to explore and understand the underlying physics and it can also aid in just tuning the design of specific prototype uh, accelerator um, designs. Um, so the next generation of accelerators needs the next generation of HPC modeling tools. Uh, so a potential avenue for improving uh, on the size and cost of accelerators relies on this plasma acceleration idea. So there's a couple ways of doing that, but you can fire either a laser beam or a particle beam through a plasma. Uh, it transfers energy and creates these uh, electric fields in the plasma that have this weight field configuration. And then there's a beam of particles kind of traveling in that wake that can get accelerated at high energies. And as of 2019, uh, the record for this uh, was demonstrated that uh, they could generate an 8 GeV particle beam in a distance of about 20 centimeters, which if you compare that to what a conventional accelerator would require, uh, it's, it's like one to two miles or something like that. Um, so uh, that's nowhere near the energy that love like the LHC, but if you want to build something that could um, accelerate things to like the multi TEV scale, the idea would be to chain a bunch of these individual stages together and you would need to like, um, the laser gets depleted of energy, you need to like inject new lasers after every stage. And there's a bunch of tuning that needs to be done to make sure the beam quality is maintained as it passes from one stage to another. But that's that's the idea. And so modeling each one of these stages is computationally intensive. And to do the whole device, you would need to model 
you know, 100 of those, and you need to be able to do large ensembles of those calculations. So this really involves kind of exascale uh, resources. Um, so this is like kind of warp X's challenge problem. Um, and so far we've, I think, done the first uh, simulation of this kind of modeling 10 stages of a laser weight field ac accelerator. You can see here, this is a in situ um, visualization. I believe this is showing the transverse electric field isocontours of it. And then it's also showing the particle beam uh, colored by the longitudinal momentum. Um, so this was an in-situ rendering done using Ascent plus VTKM. And uh, we were able to do a convergence study of this uh, using three to 768 GPUs per run and the convergent properties looked, looked nice. So that, that's kind of the Warbex you know, challenge problem there. Um, but on top of that, there are a number of other uh, application areas uh, and it's like, a, it's a growing list, I guess. So uh, people are using WarpX to study laser ion acceleration, um, to look at um, plasma confinement for fusion devices, modeling microelectronic devices, thermionic converters. Um, there's also an effort to apply WarpX to astrophysical modeling. Um, so yeah, so although it was designed kind of with particle accelerators in mind, it's a general PIC code and can be used for other things as well. Um, so just kind of an overview of the WarpX code then. Um, so we're a PIC code. So we have macro particles that represent collections of like electrons or positrons or other charged particle species. And then there's also a mesh on which we store the electromagnetic fields and the current density and charge density. Um, so WarpX, on top of the basic PIC algorithms, it implements a number of advanced features. So there's the ability to operate in a Lorenz boosted reference frame. There are high order um, spectral solvers, uh, support for embedded geometries, uh, support for mesh refinement, et cetera. Um, there's also a number of uh, multi-physics modules that come in via the Pixar library. So this models things like field ionization, Coulomb collisions, um, and QED processes like pair creation, for example. Uh, we support uh, 1D, 2D, and 3D Cartesian geometry, and also have support for a RZ a quasi cylindrical mode like this. In terms of the parallelization, we use a hierarchical approach. So uh, there's like an MPI level where we have different boxes, and this is like 3D domain decomposition. And those are divided on the different MPI ranks. And we can also do dynamic load balancing by shuffling those boxes around as we want. And then on a given node, um, what happens depends on whether we're compiling for GPU or CPU execution. For GPU, we have support for CUDA, HIP, and SICL backends. And then we also have support for an open MP uh, backend for doing multi-threaded calculations on like mini core architectures. And finally, there's support for a couple different kinds of scalable parallel I.O. formats and also support for the in-situ diagnostics. Um, so to, so to port WarpX to GPUs and to achieve performance portability, we're using the AMRX library. Uh, this was developed uh, as part of the ECP, Excel Computing Project. Um, in addition to the performance portability, it also does handles things like domain decomposition. Um, MPI communication, so when you do ghost shell exchanges or uh, particle redistribution, that's handled via AMRX. It also provides tools for uh, the mesh refinement aspect of work effects and also tools for doing the dynamic load balancing. Um, this is the way the sort of data structures work uh, on the GPU versus the CPU. So on GPU, on each box, we essentially are launching um, CUDA or HIP or DPC++ kernels. And the threads are mapped to kind of either the different cells in the box or the different particles in the box and process them concurrently. With OpenMP, we have an additional kind of layer of parallelism we support that uh, it basically does logical tiling. So this allows us to process the boxes in a more cache-friendly way and also enables using OpenMP to process different tiles at the same time. Um, so 
the bulk of the support for GPUs is done through these parallel four routines. So these are part of AMRX. It's similar to what is provided in like Coco Siraja. And that the work you're expressing is done via this Lambda function right here. And the idea is depending on how you compile the code, it will specialize it for a specific platform. Uh, this is a the, this is the result of two scaling studies, I guess, that we did on the Summit machine. So one, just using the Power9 CPUs, all the cores available um, on the nodes, and another using the V100 GPUs that are available on some. Some has six GPUs per name. Um, so what you're seeing here is both the scaling of the code, which looks quite nice up to um, 2048 nodes, and also the benefit that we get from running on the GPUs, which I think this is like a factor of 30 or something improvement on this problem. Um, I should say, so this is, these, these results are for B100, but if we run the same thing on A100, we get an additional, it's almost a factor of, of two improvement uh, comparing B100 to A100. Um, and that was nice because it, it was a fair bit of work to port Warpex to use the GPUs, but once we did that and had it running well on Summit, it just, it just ran without any code modifications on Perlmutter and it was almost twice as fast. So that's, that's nice. Um, a few other things we get from AMRX, uh, so the parallel linear solvers for solving Poisson's equation, um, embedded boundary support. And there's also a runtime parser for user provided math expressions that can run on both the CPU and the GPU that we use in Warpex. Um, so a bit about the porting to GPU process. So in order to use these parallel four routines, we had to port the kernels in Warpex from um, Fortran to C++. I wrote that backwards <laughs> in the slide. We had to port them from Fortran to C++. So on the left, this is what a routine, this is one of the finite different solvers that's available in Warpex, updating the electric field in the Y direction. This is what it looked like in Fortran. And this is what it looked like in C++. The, the original Warpex code was a mix of C++ and Fortran code. And the Fortran was kind of for the computationally expensive kernels that like crunch the numbers. Um, so I guess there's two points I want to make. What one is that other than so other than this um loop over the cells, the actual update that does the math here is almost exactly the same between the Fortran and the C++. Um, and this is facilitated by this uh, AMRX array four multi-dimensional array that's just designed to be used like as much like worker as possible. And um, you know, we did comparisons of the overhead between this C++ multi-dimensional array and Fortran, and it's it's basically nothing on, on a CPU execution. Um, so there was some upfront cost and development time for doing this port, but now we have a single code base that works for NVIDIA, AMD, and Intel GPUs, um, and still supports mini core. And again, once this process was made for V100, getting the code to run on A100 and on the MI200s that are on like Crusher was um, relatively pain-free. Um, so I wanna talk a bit about, so Warbex is one of the finalists for the uh, Gordon Bell Prize this year. And, um, I wanted to, so they let us on Frontier uh, in order to, to do some big runs and see how the code scaled there. And then we also had access to Perlmutter through the NESAP project. Um, and they were also able to do some big runs on both Fugaku and Summit. And what the simulation was, it was basically one of those plasma acceleration stages. So it's a setup kind of like this. You have the laser pulse, you have the wake field. There's a beam of particles behind it. Um, and what we got was we were seeing quite nice weak scaling um, on basically up to the full number of nodes that are available on these machines. Um, on Frontier and Fugaku, we're getting about like 85 to 90% weak scaling efficiency. And then on Perlmutter and Summit, it's maybe more like 75%. Um, but that's at like almost the full scale of the machine. Um, so in order to kind of compare performance across different machines, we use this figure of merit, which is basically a measure of the number of particles that you can update in a given unit of time. And your, the figure of merit goes up 
if either you run a bigger problem in the same amount of time or you run the same problem faster. It's kind of has both of those things rolled into it. Um, but what this chart is showing is kind of our progress in this measure um, over time. And you can see, so in transitioning from the original warp code to uh, the warp X, which is the AMRX port, um, there was a nice improvement there. And then in transitioning warp X from Cori to take advantage of the GPUs on Summit, there was again a nice improvement. And then, you know, over the years, we made some optimizations. I think there's also some times where we go backwards in here too. But, um, you know, overall, the improvement over our, in, over the pre ECP baseline. Uh, is about a factor of 500 comparing what we got on Frontier to what we got with the original warp code on Cori. And it's also about a factor of 100 just comparing where we were in 2019 with WarpX on Cori to what we saw on Frontier now. Um, so yeah, I, I like this because it kind of shows uh, there's machines with AMD GPUs, there's machines with NVIDIA GPUs, and there's also mini core machines as well. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is, so we sort of, uh, you know, it implied that you could just use this parallel for constructs and port all your kernels that way. And for the majority of the kernels in WarpX, that is all we did. For some particularly like performance critical kernels, it's worth it to do some extra tuning. And an example of that is uh, in the kind of core particle mesh routines in WarpX, so the ones that do the current deposition and the field gathering. Um, what we found was, so first of all, both of these kernels are heavily memory bound. Um, but if you don't do any particle sorting or anything like that, you're bound by the bandwidth between HPM and the uh, processors. If you do occasionally sort the particles in their cell order so that they're ordered in memory the same way the cells in the mesh are, you get a significant amount of cache reuse and you go up to being limited by the L2 bandwidth instead of DHP in the L bandwidth. And that makes a nice improvement in the overall runtime. Um, it depends a little bit on what the problem is, but it can be like a factor of five to 10 between doing this occasional sorting and not doing it. Um, we also have a shared memory version of the deposition algorithm that gives us an additional 40% improvement over is kind of the best, uh, the, the best non-shared memory version that we can do on A100. And it's actually even, it's significantly better, I would say on the MI200 GPUs. Um, and I believe that I'm, getting short on time. So I will skip the next couple slides. This is just saying that all our development takes place uh, on GitHub and we follow an open source development model and our documentation is online as well. Um, and with that, uh, thank you. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, I think there is a couple of questions in the chat. If you could just look at that one. So there's a so there's a question is is Warpex capable of hybrid CPU GPU parallelism? So we do kind of the full resident on the GPU approach. So when we compile for GPUs, everything runs on the GPU. Um, And then, okay, what is the most costly step of a basic warpback simulation? It's usually the current deposition. Um, depending on how many, if you have a very low number of particles per cell, um, you can get in a regime where the communication costs are the highest thing, but assuming that you have a good number of particles, it's current deposition. And then for what do you use to solve for the EM fields? Uh, there's a couple different uh, so there's there's a couple different finite different solvers. There's the Yi solver and the Cole Harkonnen solvers implemented in WarpX. And there's also a spectral method called the pseudo spectral analytic time domain method. That's an option as well. So there's a few different choices you have for solving for the for the fields. <laughs> 